is to please the Lord and to receive the Spirit of revival. And the Lord has taught us how to receive the Spirit of revival. You can receive the Spirit of revival every single day of your life. And it's not like, okay, you get it once and then you've got it. You get it today, you need to get it more tomorrow, and it's like an increase. It's like the river of life. It's an ongoing flow of the Holy Spirit. Um, and you need to go from ankle depth to knee to waist to over your head until the river of God is just taking you wherever He wants to take you. So we need to just tap into the spirit of revival. The spirit of revival is inside of you. Holy Spirit is revival. Jesus is revival. So when we're talking about revival, revival is not a person, a human being. It's not a, you know, a, a, an evangelist or a person or us. It is Jesus. Revival is Jesus. And it's more of Jesus than you, you, you've ever encountered. And, it, and when Jesus it becomes so big for you that he can't fit in your house. And he's, it, and he's so big. And he's already that big. But when he starts to manifest himself in your house and in your streets that people can feel him. And in your city that people will feel him in the streets. And I'll talk about that. And we talk about what is revival. So... Uh, I just want to look at some things. The questions now we're looking at is what is revival? What will it look like? And how do we receive revival? And so for many years, decades, I've been praying for revival. I'm sure some of you have been praying for years and years for revival. And South Africa needs revival. How many can agree? We desperately need it. We need, the church needs revival. Now revival basically means um, something's dead. Or half dead. And it needs to be revived. That's why we pray for revival. So we say, Lord, we want more of you. Uh, I mean, we're born again. We're born again, full of the Holy Spirit. We say we want more of you. And we want the Holy Spirit to, to move across the earth like, like he did at the day of Pentecost and even more. So, um, you know, as, I don't know if you've studied revivals, but I've studied revivals. I've looked at videos of revivals. Every time I listen, I get so excited. It's like a fire inside of me. Saying, I want to see this. I want to see this. I want to see what happened on the day of Pentecost. And I want to see it happen here. And we want to see it happen in Middleburg. Because God loves you. And God loves the people that are going to hell. And many people are going to hell. And uh, when revival comes, it's going to be so easy for them to get saved. They're going to get saved like this. The problem after that is now for you to disciple them. Because you and I are the church. The Lord wants us to disciple. Uh, he wants us to disciple that are going to get saved. All right. So this the revival that's coming is a revival of repentance and power and glory. It is an outpouring of His Spirit, and it's not just going to be signs and healings and deliverance, but repentance. Repentance means to turn back to God and repent from our sins. So it's not just going to be miracles, which we need miracles. We need signs and wonders, but it's going to be repentance. We need people who are just going to cry in the street, and they're going to say, I need to be saved. Without anyone talking to them. Without anyone saying anything, they're going to, they're going to cry out to the Lord. So I'm going to just read something to you, which is the meaning of revival. In a guy called Owen Murphy's words, okay? And it defines pretty well, very succinctly, it says, when men in the streets are afraid to open their mouths and utter godless words, lest the judgments of God should fall, when sinners overawed by the presence of God tremble in the streets and cry for mercy, when without special meetings and sensational advertising, the Holy Ghost sweeps across cities and towns in supernatural power and holds men in the grip of a terrifying conviction. When every shop becomes a pulpit, every heart an altar, and every home a sanctuary, and people walk softly before God. This is revival. Do you want to see that happen? That is when the Lord manifests. Now the Lord is omnipresent. He's present even in hell. But He's not manifesting Himself everywhere. And He's wanting us as a gate, the gatekeepers of the city to say, Come Lord, come, come. Come into Middleburg, come into Cape Town, wherever you are, come wherever you are in the world, say, come into my city and invade the city. Because there are gates 
in the spirit over your city. Today, we've come to help you to open these gates and to say, come in, King of Glory, come into my city. Today, the word revival has largely lost its real meaning. Our present generation never have witnessed the mighty moving of God in nationwide spiritual awakening such as taking place in past generations. And there's little conception of the magnitude of such a visitation. So tonight I'm just imparting a vision to you so you can say, yes, I take it. I want to see that in South Africa, but I want to see it in my house. I want to see it in the schools. I want to see it in Middleburg. I want to see it in the Karoo. All right. Heaven said revival is not religious entertainment where crowds gather to hear outstanding preachers and musical programs. Neither is it the result of sensational advertising in a God sent revival. You don't spend money on advertising. People come because revival is there. Revival is an awareness of God that grips the whole community. The whole atmosphere is charged with God. And God is giving us the grace when He comes down and He manifests Himself. Everyone is aware of His presence because He's now manifesting Himself, not just in a service like this, that some of you are aware of God's presence now. Can you imagine God's presence going across a nation in much greater power than you can feel Him now? What's going to happen to people? They don't have to come to church, to a gathering, to receive. His anointing is in the streets. So there's a, there's a vast difference between our modern day evangelistic campaigns and true revival. In the former, hundreds may be brought to the knowledge of Christ and churches experience seasons of blessings, but as far as the community is concerned, little impact is made. The taverns, the dance halls, you can see this guy wrote this a while ago, you know that dance hall the clubs, whatever, the movies are all still crowded and godlessness marches on. So if you haven't seen people stop and go to watch sport, then you haven't seen revival. I haven't seen it in my life. Where people stop watching rugby and football like happened in Wales. The, the, the revival that happened in Wales was so amazing is that the, 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 the miners, they used to swear at the donkeys and when they got saved, they stopped swearing and so the donkeys didn't know what to do because they didn't know the instructions. They didn't understand what they were all about. Hallelujah. Uh, there was no, no one went away to watch the sports game. All the bars closed. No one said you must close the sports. People got more interested in God. In the Lord, then, then soccer, football. That's amazing. Could you imagine? You know, now you've got to coach people to come to a meeting. It's like, oh, you've got to know there's sports on, there's rugby. Go, you better shut the service early. So you can see, we, that's why we need revival. Because people are more interested in sports, or politics, or entertainment, than they are in the Lord. So when we say, say revival, this is what we're talking about. In revival, the Spirit of God is like a cleansing flame sweeps through the community. Divine conviction grips people everywhere. The strongholds of the devil tremble and many close their doors while multitudes, multitudes turn to Christ. And without anyone preaching. Surely there will be people preaching, but it's not like you have to preach to get people saved. They're going to get saved on the other. They've heard the word. The backsliders are going to come running back in because the Holy Spirit will convict them. Hallelujah. And I, one of my favorite revivals is the revival at Lewis, which is the Hebrides revival. The revival on the Isle of Lewis was about, I don't know, about, yeah, in the, between 1949 and 1952. A widespread revival spread these, uh, through these islands. Um, and it just started with like uh, two ladies. One was 84 and the other one was 82. And then the Lord sent this guy, 
uh, of Christ to preach, and then revival came, and they've been praying for many years, so you don't need, you don't need many people to start a revival. The revival came, and the whole island was full of, with God's presence. Okay, so what happened was, uh, one, uh, one of my favorite stories of this revival is when the revival broke out, this guy started crying out to the Lord, and revival broke out, and, and I don't know, about one o'clock in the morning, this guy's preaching till one, get a whole lot of people, I think 800 people pre pitched up at church at 12 o'clock at night. No Facebook invitations. They pitched up at church at 12 o'clock and said, no, we, 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 we want to pray or whatever. Let them be preached to them. Then he has at one o'clock in the morning, or two o'clock in the morning, there were 300 people. Now remember, there's no like WhatsApps, nothing, no communication. They all pitched up, I think 300 picked up at the police station. <coughs> Interesting place to go to when you want to get saved. So, <laughs> you say, why would they go? That was intriguing to me. Why would they go to the police station? Uh, I later found out there actually was a, there was a man there that was known for prayer. And he was a godly man. So they woke up in the night, trembling on their beds. Trembling. And they all supernaturally went to the police station. And they said, we, 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 we need to get saved. That's revival. How would you like that, Joe? I'm not saying they're going to go to the police station. If there's a godly man there, yes. <laughs> but uh, they could be coming to your house because they know there's someone in your, your street and they're going to know you pray and they're going to come to your house. What are you going to do with 300 people? Saying we need Jesus at two o'clock in the morning. That's your Bible. Isn't that awesome? When he got there, by, on the way there, people were in the on the side of the street, crying, there was one guy crying, have mercy, crying out for God to have mercy. Just saying. Over and over, people with gripped with conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Not God loves you. And that's why, no, the conviction, they knew they were going to hell. Hell is a real place. Unfortunately, we don't preach about hell anymore. Jesus preached about hell, more than about heaven. Hell is a real place. They knew by the Spirit that they, the Holy Spirit was telling them, you're going to hell, and they said, have mercy on me. And they cried out some of them for hours until they got a release and they got saved. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. So, a while ago, Miriam got this word. Let us define, define revival. What, and this is what, okay, this is what the Lord gave to Miriam, what I'm reading now. Okay. What he's about to pour out is not a powerful meeting, or three, or a conference, where we meet in his presence. It's not a crusade or a service. It's not about what we may have known before. It is a new thing that he's doing. A new thing. When he comes, when it comes, it will shake everything in the nation to its core. It will reveal the heart of the nation and it will be hearts turned one way or the other. Either people will turn to the Lord or go completely into the Everyone will have to make a choice. I saw that he's about to pour out. What he's about to pour out is causing the very ground to shake and tremble in our nation. So I don't know if that means earthquake, but he says the ground. Now that's talking about foundations. We're talking about foundations of the government, foundations of the church will shake because the foundations are not established. The foundations are faulty. We have faulty foundations in this nation. And what he what he's going to pour out is to prepare us, okay, um, for the time that is coming in South Africa. Revival is, pre is preparation for persecution. Who's excited? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus says, you're blessed to be persecuted. What's happening? Do you know what's going on in China right now? They stepped up the persecution like 10 or 100 fold. 
They're coming at them at rapid rate. So we need to pray for the Chinese church. But they're not complaining about persecution. They just ask God for grace to stand in persecution. But it's an intense persecution that's coming on them right now. And we've been preserved from persecution. But the Lord says it's a blessing. So the, the revival is preparation for persecution because when you're so revived and so full of fire, you can go through much difficult, more difficult time without sweat, breaking a sweat. You can rejoice that you were counted worthy to suffer for His name if they beat you. Remember, Paul. So if someone whips you, you can rejoice. Revival is to give prepare you for the persecution, because the persecution is coming. Right around the world it's starting to rise. Christians are not popular anymore. Right around the world, just look what's happening in America. Look what's happening in Europe. Okay, so either you're going to join the world and say, no, I'm, I'm not one. No, 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 no I'm, I'm not a Christian anymore. No, no, I'm not like them. Or you're going to say, I love Jesus. Whether you kill me or not, whether you persecute me or not, whether I lose my job or not, I, I, I love Jesus. I'm willing to die for Him. And they're not taking the mark of the beast, which they're busy now implementing all over the world. You know the mark of the beast, 666, they're putting the, the chip in people's they, they, Some companies are actually mandating that the people take the mark. By now. Some people don't even know what the mark is. But you, you're not going to go to heaven if you take that mark. So now we need, we need to now have power. God wants to pour out His power and boldness so that you are not going to be intimidated by whatever way of persecution comes against us. And on top of that, the persecution is going to come because the greatest harvest is going to come in. And when the harvest comes in, some people, and we know the principalities will not be happy, but that doesn't mean all because we know that these people need to go to heaven. And if, even if we have to suffer a little bit of persecution, it's worth it for the sake of the lost. So revival is not just a nice to have, it's a necessity. It's not like, okay, yeah, this church, we don't want revival. This church, we want revival. And revival will be, be bypassing some churches because they don't want revival. They don't, they don't want to change, they want to carry on with their programs, and if you want to carry on with your programs, you're not going to have revival. Because the Holy Spirit's not working with your program. <coughs> He's gone. And we're not. So we need to say, let's surrender our programs and say, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit and do whatever you want. And the greatest revival of all was the day of Pentecost, where the, the original revival started. And that's the key revival is in Acts 2, 1 to 4. It says here, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there were appeared to them divided tongues of the fire, and one sat on each of them, and they were all full with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. John the Baptist spoke about Jesus coming, that he was going to baptize everyone with the Holy Spirit and and I believe you've been, been baptized with fire. You know, the day of Pentecost, they got both. The, the baptism of fire is coming. Now, the baptism of fire is the purging and the transformation of our hearts by the fire of the Holy Spirit. So, yes, you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking of tongues, but he's saying, I want to baptize. He wants to baptize with fire, firepower. And the firepower will actually push back the darkness over, over the sinners. And there will be cities in South Africa and across the world which will be cities of refuge. And you decide whether you, this is a city of refuge. And there will be cities of darkness. You don't want to go in. And it's, 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 a, it's a line. It's like goat cities and, and sheep cities are being decided right across the world. People are saying they're against Christ. They're making laws against Christ. Never mind abortion. Terrible laws are coming into place. And it's because the people are voting these people in. So the question is, what are you going to decide for to middle with? Because I know God has designated seven cities of revival. 
That means those places are going to be cities of refuge. Cape Town is one of them. P is one of them. And somebody said, what about Victoria? I said, I said I'm sorry, I didn't decide the seven cities, God did, but I'm sure revival, and I believe revival will come to Victoria and Middleburg. But you decide, I believe revival will come to every city that wants revival. But it's up to the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. And you're coming from most probably different churches, which is fantastic, because it's the, it's the one accord in one place that brings the Holy Spirit. The one accord in one place. When we're not looking at what church you're from, what church you're from, we say we're one body, one baptism, one Holy Spirit, one blood. We come together in the name of Jesus Christ. We're born again. It's not ma major on the minors. It's major on the majors. The majors. Is the word of God that we are born again, we are children of God, and we are trusting God for an outpouring at this time. And it doesn't have to start with a whole lot of people. So there's enough people tonight in this room to completely turn this whole nation around. When you get baptized with fire, and when we get filled with the Holy Spirit to the degree He wants us first, everything around you is going to change. We've seen things happen. In the last year since the Lord released the spirit of revival on us that we've never seen before. And it's not because we got we didn't it wasn't like we did anything extra. It was just the grace of God. It's the spirit of revival. Okay. So I'm just gonna give you part of the path we've been on. In nineteen ninety-eight to ninety-nine, I was fasting and praying in our business in Orange, uh, in Daleside, which is close to Orange Farm Township near Mayerton, in Gauteng. Uh, for revival, the Lord sent children there to start to gather, and we had children going from house to house praying over, over people to get saved. I mean, like 15 children, average age was about, I think, five to five or six. Some of them were like four, casting out demons. And I thought, well, this is it, revival started. Yeah, and here it is. But that was just like a, a foretaste of what God wants to do with the children. The children are very important. Hallelujah. So the Lord wants to touch the children. The Lord wants to use the children like major. I'm talking about casting out demons, healing the sick and raising the dead. And we need to not just teach them about little stories, which are very important, but we need to empower them, equip them with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and teach them how to actually raise the dead. And teach them that they can pray for the sick because God's giving children major weapons. So we need the children. We need the women, we need the men, we need every part of the church. And we can't just say, okay, they're in the children's church. God wants to raise up the children. So we saw that in Orange Farm in 2008. The Lord, when Miriam came here in 2007, 2008, the Lord, she said, what's my purpose? And he downloaded a 58-page vision over a number of months to her called the Blueprint of Revival. Has anyone here read it? Okay, three of you. Please go and read. Go and read the Blueprint for Revival. It's on our, uh, there's another website it's called globaldaysoftpw.com. Globaldaysoftpw.com. The Blueprint Part 1 and 2 is on there. It talks about how the revival is going to start, where it's going to start, how it's going to move across the nation, right into Israel. It's a powerful thing that you can start to pray through and to understand what God's going to do. And he, and he gave that Blueprint to Murray. And she didn't even know what the map looked like. And he showed you the seven cities. So that's why we are focusing on the seven cities. But you guys happen to be in between two cities. Well, a lot of cities actually. But I mean, Joburg, we're going between Joburg and Cape Town every time we used to stop at Colesburg. <laughs> now we don't go to Colesburg anymore. We come to Middleburg. I've never been to Middleburg until the last time I came in to talk about the farmers and the, God has got a blueprint for the farmers in South Africa. He's got a plan for the farmers. And, and part of that blueprint is revival uh, and, and the fire of revival on the farms. So God wants to pour revival on the farms. And so that's why we're here. So every time we go to Cape Town, looks like we might stop here. Um, and, and, and so we're excited about the plan, God's plan for your city and for your town and for, for everything He's got planned for you guys in the whole region because you're a gateway city. Right around to four directions. Okay, so on the 27th of April, so now that's 10 years, okay, so it's 2008, that's 10 years ago, Miriam gets the blueprint. We
We prayed that in for like 10 years. We didn't, we maybe shared it with five people. Did we? Because we felt it was the time and we didn't want to just share stuff in there unless the Lord told us to. 27th of April 2017, we had a gathering in our house. Okay? And this was an awesome, awesome, awesome gathering um, where we we were just praying. Twelve of us were gathering and just seeking God's direction and waiting on the Holy Spirit. And he gave Miriam uh, this very powerful vision. Okay? Um, and, and basically in April, the month before, we just released the blueprint for revival, the first part. And we had hundreds of people from the country, around the country saying they've witnessed with us, they've got some of their visions, and we start, set up seven WhatsApp groups now over the seven cities. Okay, so we're going to set up a WhatsApp group. Um, Ruth is going to have that WhatsApp group. Uh, for, for, for Middleburg, Peru, if you want to join the WhatsApp group, we've got other WhatsApp groups for other cities, so if you're part of other, one of the seven cities. But Ruth is going to set it up. So I don't know if you registered. Would you want to give them your number? Do you want to just shout your number out? I'll send it out to you. Okay, well, if you've got their number, did you register? Then she'll send you the number so you can join the WhatsApp group for revival, for those that are praying for revival, seeking the Lord for revival, for Middleburg in this area, okay? So in that meeting, um, the Lord gave. Um, very an awesome vision called the staircase to revival. Well, it's a staircase to surrender. I call it a staircase to revival. But it's a staircase to revival and just basically shows you how to get revival. It's quite simple. Um, I'll go to that slide, but I need to go into that old vision with you. He says, I'm releasing the spirit of revival to those who are hungry enough to climb the staircase of surrender into the blood. Isn't that awesome? That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to surrender. And if you're willing to surrender, the Lord will pour out a spirit of revival on you. And every day you surrender, He'll give you more and more. And when you come together, specifically if you come together, He's going to release revival over your town. I believe God can turn this town, I just called it a city just now, into a city. There's a certain number of people that need to be in a city, like kind of size of Nelspruit, into Nelspruit. Okay, so God can do that with, with middle. He can actually completely turn the economy around. He can prosper this place like you can't even imagine. But that's through the spirit of revival, but he, there's a way to get access for a city, and then the Lord gave her him later on, uh, preparing a city for revival. And that's basically how to receive oil for a city. So I'm going to share some of that with you so that you know that it's not, we're not just having a meeting tonight, we're looking at strategy, and you say, okay, from now on, what do we do? So when we go back, if we go back to Joburg, what are you going to do? You can have a great encounter tonight, God can touch you tonight in a major way, but we say, well, that's not enough. You want to continually have encounters. You want to continually receive more of His power so that when you go out, the fire goes, into, first of all, into, into you, into your homes, into your families, into your communities, onto your farms, into your businesses, into the schools. Wherever you are, the fire of God is going to be on you. It's going to spread. And we, we see that now in Cape Town. We've got an amazing testimony coming back from Cape Town what the Lord is doing with the revival fire. And that revival fire is the Lord's anointing on you. We just, the Lord is just teaching us how to access it. And giving, giving you the keys and saying, now take the keys and access it. You don't have to wait for us to come back to access revival. You can access it. We give you the keys, we say, yeah, take the keys. And the next moment we're going to hear, you're going to contact us and say, God is moving like in a major way here. So God will carry on. Hopefully we can come and join. We just like to be with the Lord. When He's moving, we like to be there. You know, we can just sit on the floor, lie on the floor, whatever. We just want His presence. You understand? But the Lord has given you keys today to revival. So wherever you live, you can say, I want revival in this school. I want revival in my house. And there you go. Those are the stairs. You climb it. 
every day. Are you hungry enough for revival? Who's hungry for revival? You're hungry. Revival is here. You get it? Revival is here. He said, wherever two or more gathered in my name, I'm here. He's there. He's here. Jesus is revival. Is he here? He's here. So what stops revival? What stops revival? He died on the cross. He's right here. We're born again. And we carry on with church. And we pray for revival for 50 years. What stops revival? The number one thing that stops revival is disunity in the church. Independence, the spirit of independence. It's like I can do my thing, I've got anointing. This our church is going to change. No, one, no one church is going to change a city. The church will change the city in a town, but not one church. Some churches want to take the whole city. You cannot. You can't have the foot taking over. There's a body of Christ in the city. There's a body of Christ. And so we've got to actually lay down our agendas, we've got to lay down our programs and say, it ain't cutting it. Until we are receiving revival, then we know we're on the right track. Revival is when we love one another and we see God moving through the body, through the hands, through the feet, through the lungs, through the heart. Because there's different parts of the body here. And we need to discern the Lord's body. And that's why many are sick and die prematurely. It's because we do not all discern the Lord's body. You've got to discern one another. You've got to discern what? What part of the body is this? What part? You need to discern each other by the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Not what church you go to. You ask the Holy Spirit, what part of the body is this one? Do you know that you're sitting in this room right now, sitting with each other's healing? Do you know that? Don't wait for some great evangelist to come through to get, get you healed. Because the great evangelists that come through town, and they're not going to come through this town that often, it's not that big. But the, the guys that come through South Africa and, and big names are talking about the, the healing rate maybe is only 10 or 15 percent. So you're talking about 85 percent failure rate of people they pray for. Now Jesus had a 100 percent success rate and he said greater works you will do. And we're doing the lesser works. So God wants you to do the greater works and the greater works he's showing me is in you. It's not in me. Let's say I pray for everyone. Maybe the Lord can take my rate up to 20 percent hit rate. That means 20% of the people I pray for, 2 out of 10 will get healed instantly. It's good. I mean, we thank God for the 2. What about the 8? I mean, some people are going bald through that. So many people lay hands on their head. And they're still trusting God. And, they, and, and then they, they're getting disappointed. They think, God doesn't love me. They heal this one, heal this one. What's wrong with me? And they're getting discouraged because God hasn't given them their breakthrough. If, if your body gets sick, how does your body get healed? Huh? If you get, if, let's say you cut your knee. Okay, so you gash your knee today. What, how do you get it, your knee healed? There's a doctor healing you. There's a plaster healing you. Your knee has got blood, and the blood comes around at every part around your knee, immediately assembles and brings healing and starts to restore that part of the body. Your body, and my body, is designed to heal itself, right? All the healing you need is in you. You know that? There's just a block. You've got to find out what the block is. And if, you have, if the block is removed, you have a breakthrough. And the breaker lives in you. So your miracle is just close. Because he's in you. You don't have to wait for some famous preacher to come and get you healed. The most famous preacher of all is in you. His name is... Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's living in you. The miracle work is living in us. And so when he shows me, he's saying, he's saying, well, let's say you, you have got a key for that lady in the pink. I don't know what your names are. And then the lady in the pink has got a key for this lady in the green. And the lady in the green has got a key for that little girl lying in the back. In the mattress. Hello. 
And that little girl, yeah, you two, have got a, you, you've got a key for this man here, with the grey shirt and the jeans. And you've got a key for that man in the blue shirt. And you, in the maroon shirt, t-shirt, has got a key for that lady in the green. And you, <laughs> you, you've got keys, you've got keys with, with, with these, for this couple here. So can you imagine if you don't use your keys, and you're waiting for the pastor, the preacher, to have all the keys. He doesn't have all the keys. The body has the healing. And he says, many of you are died prematurely and are sick because you do not discern. Discern the Lord's body. So God gives you a word now for someone here. You say, no, that can't be from God. That's imagination. Fine. I'm not going to make a fool of myself. So now God wants to use you, but you are too afraid to go and pray for someone because you might fail. Or you don't like that person because they go to another church. Remember that the healing is in the body of Christ in Middleburg, not in one local congregation, by the way. So if you don't start mixing, you're going to stay sick, in bondage, and in poverty. That's just how it is. And that's just how it is around the world. But when we start to come together in unity, you're going to start to share your keys because you love one another. And if you love one another, you'll serve one another and you'll start to pray for one another. Spontaneous combustion will happen and that's the revival that's coming is a, is a body revival. It's not a preacher revival of some famous Amos. It's Jesus. And no one's going to know who, who the person was that God used to bring the healing. In most cases. Because Jesus works for glory. He doesn't want to share it. It's difficult to give him all the glory. Especially when you've been praying and working hard. You'd like at least 1%. Credit God. Take some credit. Jesus gets 99. But actually, we've got to give him all the glory. And so what happens when the Lord starts using you, and we've seen this in Job, in our meetings there, that recently we had a lady, her whole hip got replaced. Now that's all, there's a body part division in heaven, all the parts are there, so if you need a new eye, it's in heaven. All you need someone is, someone around you to go and pull it out for you. And if you had the faith, you would have pulled it out long ago. So don't worry about it. You know, often when you're sick, you don't have the faith to get yourself healed. But it's because of a lack of faith, we don't get healed. And if it's not that, it's because there's judgment on us. But in most of the case, it's because of a lack of faith. You can go and look at Jesus, how he trained his disciples and rebuked them for little faith, little faith, unbelief, whatever, when they couldn't cast out demons. So just repent. I repent often for that, unbelief. So I pray for many people that haven't got healed. And the Lord said, I must start to repent to them. When last did you repent to someone for not getting the healed? <laughs> Seriously. Just say, I'm sorry, I'm working on this thing. Uh, maybe I must pray again. Maybe I'll fast and pray to get delivered from the Spirit of my But the gift of healing is as the Holy Spirit wills, and He decides who to give the keys. And when we start to come together and allow the body to minister to one another, you're going to see so many miracles happen. We're going to see supernatural, and He will get the glory. It won't go to some evangelist. We've got to go, and this guy's coming down. Everyone's going to fill the building. We're going to have uh, 100,000 people come, and this guy's going to pray, and there's going to be miracles, and five people in wheelchairs got healed. But another 500 went home with their wheelchairs. You don't see that. No. Because that doesn't get on Facebook. <laughs> people are selective with what they publish. And we normally only put our best face in front. And the worst face we hide. Always. We just naturally like that. Humans. Okay? <laughs> so, but, but what we've got to do is start admitting that we actually are not really proficient at getting people healed. We have an 85 or 90% failure rate. We thank God for the 10%. But why is the 90% not getting healed? It's the body. 
body is sick because the body is in disunity. And the body is fighting one another. So the greatest thing we can do to work towards revival is come together. From different churches and come together and say, let's forget our differences. How can I help you? How can I help you? Did you say this? How can I help you? Just pray for them. You can just start by praying for them. Finding out each other's needs. But normally it's like, we just got to put everything into this local church, and this local church is going to be this local church. And so we've got all these franchises set up, which are competition. Now if you've got a franchise mentality in the church, and you Kentucky Fried Church, I mean Kentucky Chicken, a Kentucky Fried Chicken, and the other one is McDonald's, you are competition. So you don't want people to go to that church because that you're not going to... Get the cash flow. <laughs> and uh, whatever. Uh, you know, be able to have that brag ability of how many people come to a church. Now we've got 5,000, we've got 20,000. But we're losing the city. Because we're not coming together. And no one local church can take the city. It's like the foot says, I'm the body. Like what? I don't care how big your foot is. It's not the body. And some churches want to take over the whole church city. They cannot take over those cities. If God didn't design the body that way, you're one part. Just find out, are you the new church, the lung church, the heart church, the finger church? What church are you? And then in that church, what part are you of that church? Because it's a body within a body. And everyone needs to know what part they are and to serve one another. And then we're going to see, you won't be dying prematurely of cancer. Because your healing is in somebody here. And maybe somebody that's not here. In fact, these empty chairs here could be where your are is. And your provision could be in those empty chairs. Because provision and healing is the two areas where the devil is taking God's people all across the world. Healing and provision and the other one's relationships. He takes you those three, he's got you. And everyone's saying, I'm waiting for breakthrough. I'm waiting for breakthrough. He says to me, you pray, I come through. You like it? <laughs> I didn't like it when I heard it. But I knew it was true. I must break, then he comes through. So this revival is all about me breaking, dying to self, and to let the Holy Spirit come through and work for unity. And say, well, I'll pray, I will go across the walls, I'll go across the borders and reach out and just obey the Holy Spirit and pray for whoever he says. So congratulations for you who came here tonight from other congregations. And some of you can't even see the walls, but some of you can see the walls. In the church, there's no supposed to be any walls. It's kingdom. We're transferring from churchianity to kingdom. To the kingdom mindset, but we've got to have a body mindset and we've got to say, I'm here as part of the body. I must bring healing. Every one of us has got healing in us. Every one of us must heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Every single one. And when does that start? The moment you say. In China, the way they take, check out, if you say it there, because you know they've got the Red Army trying to actually infiltrate the church, you get tested there because they put you in a room, once you say, for a week, for a day or so, they put you in a room with a demon possessed person. And then they say, cast it out. Because if you've got the Spirit of God, you can cast out demons. But if you're a spy, you're going to have a seven Sunday Steel expedition. <laughs> a demon in a club, that person said. <laughs> They're not going to come back spying again. But if you're a full of God, you're going to cast the demons out. Some people will be saved 10, 20 years until they've cast one demon. Jesus says, if those who believe will speak in other tongues, they'll lay their hands on the sick and they'll be healed. Now cast out demons. Cast out demons. Part of your job description. Part of your job description. Not for the evangelists. Not for the fivefold ministry. For everyone in the church must be casting out demons. My job is not to do that. My job is to teach people how to do that. That's what I do. I equip people for the work of the ministry. And so what happens when revival comes, there's going to be a lot of work. Who's going to do the work? Who's going to do the work? We, we are going to do the work. Revival in one word is harvest. Any farmers here? What 
five star. Okay, but it's here time or work. You gotta work until the harvest is taken in. And when God says the Bible is hard, it's like, whoa, no harvest back. <laughs> See old God, you know that. <laughs> so actually, we gotta work hard when the Bible comes to bring in the the, 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 the harvest. We're gonna bring in the harvest, then we've got to clean the harvest, we've got to cast that demon. Two in the morning, casting that demon. You've got to baptize it in your pool. Your bath, your shower, bucket, whatever, a barrel, throw them in there, in, in the river. Where? Don't hold them for more than three minutes. And take them out. <laughs> Jesus raises the dead. <laughs> Don't kill them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So now, we had this awesome meeting, and the Lord poured out the Spirit of Revival. Um, and, the, the, and the Spirit of Revival came upon us, and we, uh, it was just simply amazing what the Lord did. The Lord did an amazing thing for us that day. Um, and I wanted to show you the video. And now I'm on my phone. Hallelujah. Uh, I just wanted to show you this video, but the Lord brought out the, the flame of revival on us, and the Lord said we must host the revival, we must host the, the flame of God, and so a friend of ours, his name is Hope, he's a, uh, one of the spiritual sons of Angus, Angus, and he was going to him the next week, and he spoke to him about uh, what God did in the previous week, and the, the fire pouring out there, everything at our meeting. And so uh, he said to Uncle Angus, now they all had a separate time with him because they do this, I think, twice a year. Um, and and uh, so anyway, he said, will you blow on the flame? So guess what? He took the flame from our meeting, because he was in our meeting. He took it to Uncle Angus, who he has got, got, got authority, in the spirit, and in South Africa, um, which we, we understand, we recognize. He took it in and he, and, he, and he blew on the fire, on his hand. He took it like and said, blow on the flame. And he blew on the flame. Okay. So that to us was very encouraging, but not, not only that, did he blow on the flame, he, he made a video for us, which I wanted to show you. This was like last, no, last year in May, okay? Um, so I just want to find the video that I sent it. Find the right, find the right video for you. Um, Problem computer is quite, quite a challenge. Let's see if I can get this. And Miriam, I greet you in Jesus' precious name from Shalom. And uh, Hope has asked me just to greet you and to bring you a word of encouragement. I want to thank you for that flame that you have been praying over for so long. It is now expanding into a huge forest fire, which I believe will consume this nation and indeed the continent of Africa and the world. And it's because of your faithfulness. Keep up the good work. We love you very much. And we look forward to meeting you one day and shaking you by the hand. God bless you from Angus. Goodbye. Hallelujah. So that to me is amazing. Uh, because of the spiritual authority that he carries. And he quickly, without knowing the blueprint, prophesied the blueprint. And he said that fire is going to be a forest fire 
and it's going to go through South Africa, Africa, and the world, which is basically what Miriam saw. The revival that's coming through the seven cities of South Africa is going to go through Africa into Israel and explode across the world. And you've got part of that. So what a responsibility we can to host revival. It's the number one priority for South Africa. Not a new political party. Because I can tell you something now, and I, I, I'm very excited about this stuff happening in the politics, but there's just one problem. You can have the most righteous uh, Fantastic policy, policy out there. I believe there are fantastic uh, parties out there now that are, that are Christian based and are awesome. But there's just one problem for them. If people have wicked hearts, they will vote for wicked leaders. If you go to any prison, you'll find out who runs the prison. It's not the most righteous dudes, it's the, mafia, the internal mafia. That it works like that, and so it works in, in society today. So, unless South Africa has a heart transplant and repents, they will still vote for parties that are pro abortion, which is the worst thing that you can vote for <coughs> killing babies, murder. And you have Christians, you know, so South Africa, so called 75% Christian. But they're not voting according to the word. <coughs> How can you support any party? And there are parties now that Christians support that are actually pro-abortion. So we cannot support them. I don't care. It's in the, not a majority of you kids. Now how can you wonder? How are you going to stand before the Lord one day and say, I voted for abortion? Oh, well, Lord, you don't know. It was, we needed an opposition party. Really? So the problem here is that we need revival order for God to change government. And the revival will bring the change of government. The heart will change and if God wants to then change the political party by getting people to vote according to their conscience and according to God's word, then everything will change. But we can bring out all the parties and bring all the sing songs but when people are covered and controlled by things they don't even understand like the, the, the witchcraft that is going on even in the churches People don't understand the, the power of what's going on. How people's minds are controlled. They're programmed. They're programmed. So you can bring out any party and people are not going to vote for it because it's not speaking to their hearts. Their hearts are wicked. So what do we need? South Africa. Revival. Where people's hearts, the stony heart will be taken out and God will give them a new heart. And when you get a new heart, you're going to do a different vote. And you will stand against abortion. You will stand against them because it's, not, it's, it's murder. It is murder. All right, so now we'll say, well, the Christians are in the minority. Not, not after revival. When revival comes, Christians will be Christians and not submarines. You know the submarine Christian? Sundays, submerged. Sundays, <laughs> and they will not be the prophets of doom. Okay, so <laughs> people doing all kinds of funny things. I mean, really, there's laws against poisoning people. So what do we have to preach more laws about that? Because it's obviously wrong. I mean, you shouldn't be poisoning people in the church. You know, I know it says you can drink deadly things, but you're not supposed to tempt the Lord the, your God. But it's like crazy. So we need revival. The revival will change the fabric of South Africa and change Africa and unlock the wealth of Africa and we're going to see Africa feed the world. <coughs> this is a Joseph continent. We have a wonderful redemptive purpose in Africa. And so now is our time and the devil says, no, your time's up. Especially you pale faces. You've got to go back to Europe. Malukas, whatever you want to call it. I say, no, God sent me here. I'm, I'm made out of Africa. God's called me here. And God calls me anywhere, I'll go there. It doesn't matter. God has called you. We are Africans. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So God has given us an evidence back. We need to do what He's called us to do here. And that is to bring His presence, bring revival here, so that people can go to heaven. Never mind having a good government and a good country, but ultimately, Jesus is coming soon. 
and we need, people need to get ready. There are billions of people going to hell. Can you imagine one person burning in hell forever? You know, one thing that really changed my life is when the Father showed us a vision one day of Orange Farm, and every town is like this, by the way. He showed us, he was taking these photos out of a photo album, and on that photo album is Orange Farm, which is a township with about 500,000 people. And he was taking them pictures out of the photo album, some of these pictures, and he was throwing them in to, to this dustbin full of fire. And he was weeping. And he was basically saying to us, do you care? These are my children. And I'm having to put them in hell because you don't care. That was in 2004. You don't care about the township. You don't care about the people going to hell. And God wants us to care. And the spirit of revival, the spirit of fire, the spirit of love in our hearts will break your hearts when you see someone get you know these people are going to hell. What's stopping them going to hell? What's stopping them going to, to heaven? What is making them go to hell? It says in the Bible, the God of this world has blinded their minds lest they believe in the glorious gospel. So there are principalities and powers ruling over cities like in dark formations that are pre, that, they have, that have got a whole matrix of darkness over our cities. And this is what we're warring against. But when revival comes, God will tear that veil. And you will have an open heaven over your cities and your towns. And we will see the glory of God come in and invade the cities and towns. And suddenly people they couldn't see before, wouldn't see, atheists will get saved in a second. Because the veil has been torn. What veil? The veil of darkness. The second heaven realm. Where the principalities rule. Revival is about God removing principalities. Revival is about God dethroning principalities over your community that are bringing in the drugs, the sex, the sex trafficking, the slave, all the trade, all that stuff. That's ruled by principalities. Don't focus on the people. Our war is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rules of darkness. Who God has given you and me, the church, authority over if we walk together in humility and walk together in unity. We have got the keys to shut that thing down. When I say that thing, I'm not talking government on earth, I'm talking the government in the second heaven. Because they are the puppeteers. Forget about the people that you see on Facebook and on the news shouting their mouths off. Because if they get removed in one hour, they can be replaced by another hundred. Worse than them. There are replacements for everything. The problem is not with those people that hate us. The problem is with the principalities that is poisoning them and controlling and pulling the strings. The witchcraft. The whole thing with the farm murders. Where do you think that's coming from? The principalities and powers. And so when we come together and God pulls out revival, those things will be shifted. God will bring the church into elevation so that we can rule and reign with the 24 elders in heaven and legislate and declare and decree and it will happen. But one intercessor doesn't have authority over the whole city. You might think you do. But if you did, then the city would have been changed. But not right now. You have authority in the city. But you do not have governmental authority over cities. And over principalities. But the church does. Which church? The United. Have you seen it yet? The one accord church. Do you know there was only one church in the book of Acts? Did you notice that? And they all met in houses. One church, house church. One church, house church. There were no denominations in the book of Acts. Turn the world upside down. We're going back there. We're going back there. And it's going to start with you. It's going to start with the remnant. Doesn't have to start with everyone in town. You've come today to make a declaration. We want church. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting in this building. And we can love one another and we say, Lord, we're going to do it your way. We've tried it our way for 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 2,000 years, and it hasn't worked. We're going to try and do it your way. It's called the one accord way. There's only one way to change a nation 
that's in one accord. One accord in one place. Then the Holy Spirit came. God says in Psalm 133, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Go there in your Bibles. Let's go there. This is the most, I would say, the most important scripture. One of the most important scriptures. But I ask two is. One thirty three. You got it? Psalm one thirty three. Now behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So guess why? You know that the disunity in the church is what making you sick? Or keeping you sick, keeping you poor, and wondering where your breakthrough is. Because like I said, somebody in another church has got your feet. And even in the local churches, there's division. So when the church comes together in one accord, one place, it says, For brethren to behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil upon the head. Okay, now whose head is this? It's talking about Aaron, the priest. This is the body of Christ. We are part of the body of Christ here. You're the middle word, body of Christ. One church in Middleburg, by the way. There's only one church in Middleburg. Just tell everyone tomorrow. One church. I found it. Wait, wait. <laughs> You're the church. This building, not a church. It's a building. You're the church. You're the living stones. See, it's like precious oil upon the head. It's the oil of the Holy Spirit. The olive. Poured out the anointing of God. Hallelujah. Upon your head. What is that? Unity brings anointing. The more unity, the more anointing. So the anointing is what destroys the yoke of poverty over you. The anointing that increases by unity destroys the cancer or the sickness over you. The anointing destroys the crime over the city. It's the anointing. The word anointing is Messiah. You know that? In Greek it's Christos. So we call it Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah. The anointed one and his anointing. So you've got a word anointing. It's Messiah. He's the anointed one. Now the anointing that is upon you is what destroys the yokes around you. But the anointing that's upon us destroys the yoke over you. All of us in the whole city. So we need to fly high and to understand what we've been missing out and why we've been missing out on the breakthrough. It's because of our pride, our independence, our stubbornness, our religiosity, our self-righteousness. And these things I'm listing now are some of the things we can lay down just now. We have to lay those down and say, Lord, forgive me. And then the Lord can anoint you to go and pray for someone in this room just now. And I trust the Lord will release many miracles through you. The thing that excites me the most is you see the miracles happening through the body of Christ. Not through our ministry, through you. Because you are the body of Christ. All the healing of Christ is in you. But the Holy Spirit is the one that decides on the gifts by His will. There's nine gifts of the Spirit. One of them is the gift of healing. One of them is the gift of faith. And it's the Holy Spirit that decides who gets that gift. And if you've got a gift of healing and someone else you don't like needs it, they're not going to get that healing. And if you need healing and someone doesn't like you or love you, you're not going to get your healing. Because I can pray for you all day long. And if I don't have enough faith, you won't get healed. I, I need our great faith. But the gifts are something else. You don't even almost need faith. Because the Holy Spirit is over it. just gives you that gift of faith. And you just get healed. Some people say, I don't even believe it. They got healed. So, <laughs> it's a strange statement to make. But that's what happens when the gifts come. And we need to be get, get people healed through our faith. 
and also the gifts, because the gifts, these are amazing. When the gifts of the Spirit operate through the body, it's as He wills. And the problem is, we just made it around the pulpit ministry, and this guy or woman on the pulpit, and it's not. It's not around the healing team either. Now we've got a healing team now, church. And then we've got the deliverance team. So I'll get good news. There's no healing team or deliverance team anymore. It's you. You are the healing team. You're the deliverance team. And I've got good news. You're the worship team. <laughs> you are the worship team. And we're going to worship tonight with the audience of one. You know, there's no one there. God's there. Just worship Him tonight. Perform for Him. Perform for Him. Just tell Him how much you love Him. That oil is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard. Jesus' beard was pulled out. So that we can be one. The beard of Aaron. Jesus. Aaron is the type of shadow of Jesus. We are the priesthood of God on earth. Running down to the edge of his garments. Remember that lady with the issue of blood? She grabbed and said, if I could just touch, I'll be healed. Can you imagine? You are that person. When we're walking in unity, the oil is going to drop off you. Let anyone that touches get healed. Would you like that? Because it's anointing. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. The spirit of anti-Christ is the spirit of anti-anointing. Any church, any person against the move of the spirit, against the Holy Spirit, is an anti-Christ spirit. Anti-anointing. We've got to unclog these words so you know what it means. Anti-Christ is anti-anointing. Anti-Holy Spirit, anti-tongues, anti-healing. That is the anti-Christ spirit. I'm not saying they are the anti-Christ, like as in one person. No, they are operating under the anti-anointing spirit. And you cannot move with that spirit. That spirit is anti-Jesus, anti-anointing, anti-move of the spirit. And that spirit is going to come against you. Hallelujah. That's where the persecution comes. From the religious people. Back in Jesus' day. Who crucified Jesus? The anti-Christ spirit. Why did they persecute Jesus? Because he had nice sermons. He was drawing masses of people and they were all leaving their meetings because they were so bored with these meetings. They were jealous and they were atheists. They said, we've got to kill him. We're going to lose our paychecks from the Romans. And they said, this is not good for business because this business is going down because he's overturning the tables in the temple. Not popular. That's the anointing that turns the tables. It's the anointing that casts out demons, races and death. It's the anointing. And the anointing is in you. So tonight, the Holy Spirit wants to unlock you. And He's unlocking some of you as you agree. Some of you are still wondering what is going on. But don't worry. If you believe, it shall be according to your belief. If you don't believe, it will be according to that. It's up to you. You can decide. You're going to be unlocked and let the Holy Spirit out and let the anointing flow into the streets because He's been waiting to get out. The best kept secret in Middleburg. The anointing. Jesus. He wants to get out of here. In the school. You in school? You're out of school. So you're not here. Almost. 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 Huh? Jeez, you've got to leave there with a bang. Monday. Boom. Bang. Shake a hand. You need the five guys in the school. Go there with a bang. Go there with a bang. It's like, I'm leaving. Ah, thank you, Holy Spirit. Have a healing service. No, fire in the schools. Praise Jesus. The, the Holy Spirit wants to come out. So what we do is we keep him in. Luke just says, lift up your heads, all your gates. Be lifted up your ancient doors, and the King of glory shall come in. So you lift up your heads, he comes in, and then he says, now I want out. 
The veil has to be torn. The veil of your flesh. Your pride. Your fear of man. What will people say? Has to die. Because if you're afraid, people might persecute you. And he says, if you're embarrassed about him, he's going to be embarrassed about you on that day. So it's now the time to make some decisions. We're not embarrassed about him anymore. We don't care if they mock us, throw eggs at us, and they say, say whatever, holy rollers, happy clappers, whatever, what they want to call us, they're irrelevant. So I bring it on. The more you persecute me, you're just sending rewards to heaven for me. Let's just keep on doing it. Because he says you must get very happy when they persecute you. Because great is your reward. Great is your reward in heaven. Hallelujah. And he says here, yeah, running down the edge of his garment is like the dew of Hermon. Mount Hermon, where the snow came down and the snow melted, came down into the valley. Descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Where does he command the blessing? Where there's unity. You don't have to pray for blessings. The Lord, if you unite, God commands blessings. They will overtake you. Imagine God says, I command a blessing on the Lord. What's going to happen? On the church of the Lord. Because you are the salt of Middleburg. He commands a blessing on the church, the whole Middleburg is blessed. Because you are the salt that preserves the whole city. Even if it's just a hundred, fifty. That blessing will, will just invade the whole city. And people will come to the light that's on you. Because the light that's on you is actually bringing them to Him. Because it doesn't help that we can't pay our accounts. And we're Christians. Now I know what that's like. I've been there. I know what that's like. So there's no judgment on you. It's just very shameful that we're Christians. We can't pay our accounts. I'm saying, something is wrong. And you can be tithing for years and still can't pay. Some people say they can be tithing for lives. I say, well, that's only one scripture. There are many scriptures. 2,300 scriptures about money. Try and read those ones. At that time. There are many scriptures about money. And that's the warfare. The warfare is against the spirit of mammon. So the Lord told us that he's releasing the spirit of Bible. So tonight we are going to now. Now, this is preparation. Now I'm gonna we're just gonna briefly look at that and we're gonna start to surrender. We're gonna start to surrender, lay it down, and then we're gonna get filled up with the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to start to thank God and praise God and worship God. And at some point, we're going to pray for you. Or for those that want prayer. For God to just fill you with more fire. I don't know. But, but it's all up to you how hungry you are. And say, Lord, I, I want it all. I want you all. And the more you surrender, he told us years ago, the greater the surrender, the deeper the encounter. So if you really want to encounter God tonight, you say, I'm going to surrender to this. And it will bring those thoughts up in your mind. And those things that jump in your mind when you're trying to pray, those are the very things. You put it in the blood, you bind it to the cross and you surrender. And when you do that, and you climb those st that staircase, that staircase over there, the staircase of surrender, He starts to release upon you the spirit of revival. And from the time we receive the spirit of revival, everything in our lives is accelerated. So we come here with good news. The good news is the spirit of revival has been released. And the Lord showed this to Miriam. The Lord showed this to Neil, a friend of mine, about that the, the, the revival is here. He's here. He says it's here. So all you've got to do is say, step on and say, I'm receiving. But before you can step into it, you need to surrender. And say, Lord, I surrender. Pay the price. The price you have to pay is your life. Lay down your life and say, Lord, whatever it takes. And he says, forgive this one. Forgive this one. Bless this one. Pray for this one. Give me your finances. You might have to lay down 50 things tonight. I don't know. Sometimes it can take me an hour to surrender. But the more surrendered I am, the quicker it is because I, live, I, have, to sur I have to daily surrender. Every day I have to surrender. And the more I surrender, the more the spirit of revival comes upon me. 
And the more you surrender, the more the spirit of revival comes upon you. And he's bringing that revival wherever you go. And you can release it wherever you go. By faith, you can release fire. So we're going to come, we come here tonight to release fire of God, or fire of God, upon you. And then you're going to release it. And then you're going to start to gather some more in unity by the Spirit of God as He brings you together. I, I believe often you gather together in unity. So this place is going to be far too small. But it's a good start. <laughs> Seriously. And you're going to see miracles. And allow the Holy Spirit to run the, the meetings. Just allow the Holy Spirit to run the meeting. I know it's one of the most difficult things there is to allow the Holy Spirit to run a meeting. But we have to allow the Holy Spirit to run the meetings. No clock, no time. Let the Holy Spirit run the meetings. Because people are dying. Christians are dying. They're losing loved ones. Because we, we don't know what we're doing. We, we've kind of lost the plot. I don't like to see people lose their fathers and mothers. I don't like the fact that we're having to bury Christians that are like got young children. That to me is a shameful thing. It's like, Sunday's not. I don't see Jesus doing that. He said that they buried the dead. He messed up the funeral. Why are we burying dead people? Why are we burying He said, this is it. That's why we need revival. So we go to admit, I'm dead. I'm born again dead. Okay, I'm born again, but I'm dead. Because I'm not raising dead people. Who calls to raise dead people? When you get to heaven, you say, where are all the dead people you're supposed to find? Where are all the demons you're supposed to find? Now that was the pastor's job. Where in the Bible does it say that? It's the pastor's job to cast out demons. No, but he told me. He said, well, didn't you read your own Bible? <laughs> you can't blame the pastor in heaven. You can't blame your denomination. You can't blame the church. He says, I told you to study the Word of God. I told you to study the Word of God. In Timothy, he says, study the Word. Say, study to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. <coughs> you need to be approved unto God. What? In your study of the word. Now people don't study the Bible. We've got apps. We've got this. We've got this. We've got so many teachings. We don't know what to do with it. We've got 15 Christian channels. And Christians still can't cast out a demon. <laughs> and we're still burying dead people. So if you want to raise some dead people, you have to pray for dead people. Who knows? This week could be your the opportunity. Go to bed. Watch it. Take place. Someone dies. Go pray for them. For some people, shouldn't be dead because they're in hell. That's why we need to raise them because they're in hell. And I tell you, when they come out of hell and you've raised them up from hell, they're going to be evangelists. <laughs> they just see the town. After they've been dead for four days or ten days. But it works. We haven't even got to the four days. Wait till you see someone come out of dead that's been dead for two years. Can Jesus raise someone from the dead that's been dead for two years? Can he? Yes. Can Jesus resurrect in the life? He's going to resurrect the entire planet. Isn't he? Even if you're dead for a thousand years, boom! When he comes, the dead Christ will rise. What's that? No problem for you. It's just a problem in our head. Oh, they've been dead for more than four days. It's a problem. So you start praying. We are be challenged with that. Okay, now they're in the grave. You stop praying when they're dead. When they're dead. You, you, you give up. Do you think God can't get someone out of the, out of, out of the grave? Blockages. Blockages. But that person may need you to raise them from the dead because they could be in hell right now screaming. When they come back out of hell, they're going to give you the big eye. And then they're going to tell everyone about Jesus. No problem. You won't have to train them out of your vanity. They're trained already. You got it? So we are preparing. And we're climbing the staircase of revival. <coughs> the staircase of revival is where you surrender everything 
of your life, of your, of your life, of your ministry, everything into the blood of Jesus, everything into his hands. And you say, Lord, I give it all. Your ministry, your business, your visions, your dreams, your Isaac, you lay it down and say, Lord, I give it to you. I give it to you. I surrender. Abraham was called to die. And some of you have to actually give up Isaac in order to inherit the nations. If Abraham didn't kill Isaac, he wouldn't be the father of many nations. You understand? When he gave up Isaac, the father could give up his son. He wants us to participate in this process. He's not just doing it. He wants you to take that step. He's done the first step and he says, now surrender Middleburg. Surrender the city and I am going to pour my spirit out upon you, in you and through you. Because he wants to use you. And I'm not saying he hasn't used you. And you can have a fantastic Isaac ministry. And Isaac was a son. He was born. That was a, I mean, it was a miracle. A complete miracle. Has a son. He's a hundred. Him. He believed God could raise Isaac from the dead. Otherwise, he wouldn't have killed him. He was ready to kill him because he said, Well, God's going to give me children through him, so I'm going to kill him and then God raised him from the dead. That's what he said to him. It's amazing faith. He didn't even have a Bible. You know, Abraham didn't have a Bible. <laughs> and he had so much faith. So the Lord wants you to lay it down tonight. And he, he wants us to lay it down and say, Lord, we surrender it because we want the spirit of revival. Because it's the spirit of revival that's going to change me, change my family, change the street, change the community, change the church, change this nation. The spirit of revival, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ. He wants to come. And we have to invite him. And tonight is the night. This is the night. I want to just read something from the word that the Lord gave to Miriam, preparing a city for revival fire. She saw these whirlwinds coming out. When you, one of the things that happens when you surrender tonight is like a whirlwind coming out of you. A whirlwind. And whatever you release from your heart goes to heaven and goes on an altar which is burning with fire continuously. And when you release that, okay, the Lord then inverts that will with and He starts to pour out oil over you. Over you individually. Each individual gets their own encounter with God and He anoints your head. That means He you anoints your mind to think with the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is the mind of anointing. It's the anointing of the mind. God ideas. God strategies for whatever you call. In business, whatever you call. In ministry, that's the anointing comes on your mind when you surrender. The spirit of revival is coming upon your head. Okay, so now can you imagine that? It's going to happen now. You're going to step in faith, surrender, and when you're surrendering, the oil is coming down on you. You remember, he brings the oil and then he brings the fire. But before that oil is the blood. Blood, oil, and the fire. Before the blood is the oil, which is the word. So it's the water, that's the oil. Water, blood, oil, and fire. And when the oil is upon you, guess what's going to happen next? Fire! On your head, like in the book of Pentecost. Now, I'm not saying literally people see fire, but that would also be very good walking in future places. Fire all over you. <laughs> Seriously, we're going to see some signs and wonders. And so, what happens is the fire is going to come on you, and the fire is going to destroy the stronghold of Satan. The fire is going to destroy strongholds around you, and the fire is going to spread, and especially burns where people are dead. 
one more dead tree. So five, just what we need. A lot of dead people. <laughs> dry people. You say, well, it's too dry. Fantastic. <laughs> Set it on fire. Burning material. The problem is these ones that are half dry, they can't burn because they think they've got the anointing and they've got enough. It's like, really? When you're raising the dead. You're not raising the dead every day. You need some more anointing. <laughs> you understand? Everyone you pray for getting healed instantly like Jesus? No? Okay. You need some more anointing. Once upon a time I saw that, yeah, what happened? And so God wants you to have the same ministry as Jesus. And me. Not just me, you. Same ministry as Jesus. Everyone you pray for, heal instantly. Not over three years. Instantly. That's the standard. That's your standard, by the way. That's my standard, Jesus. Not Smith Bigglesworth, who had an amazing standard. Or John G. Lane, or Rhino Parkey, or Benny Hinn. That's not your standard. Jesus is your standard. Much higher standard. None of them healed every, can get everyone healed instantly. Not the one. But I still think that's coming through the body. Then what Jesus did. We. That's what God just says to you. Tomorrow, go to the local hospital, lay hands on the hospital. On the hospital. I'm talking about the boat. You go to the local hospital. Okay. How many people are in there? Twenty. Oh, it's a small one. You can go to Job and go big one. <laughs> <laughs> so start with a small hospital, twenty, and God says be healed, and you say be healed, and they all jump out of there. Healed. Instantly. You have revival right there. We go to the oh, go to the mortuary. How many people there? Hang me around. Close. whole hospital. You won't have to chase the news or anything like that. The news will chase you because signs will follow you. You won't be following the signs. The signs are supposed to be behind you, not in front of you. The signs will follow you. The problem is Christians are running around looking for signs going from one meeting to the next to get a sign. Meanwhile, the signs are supposed to be following us. The church is supposed to be healed already after 2,000 years. We're supposed to be living in divine health. It's the world that's supposed to be coming to us for healing. But we now know why we're sick in the church. Just unity. Lack of faith. Those two. There are other reasons, but those are the two primary reasons. That's why we're so sick. That's why we die prematurely. But now we know what the solution is. We know what the solution is from the Lord. So the, basically the oil comes upon you and he said to me, listen to this, he has a question, do you know what happens when whirlwinds join? It becomes a bigger world. <coughs> it gets stronger. It becomes, so imagine you, all of you tonight, start surrendering, right? And that whirlwind joins together in one whirlwind. What's going to happen? You're going to have one big whirlwind over your entire city. You got it? You'll do this. When we surrender to Him, we receive oil in the place of what we surrendered. When we come together, we then receive oil corporately and we receive so much more. You receive oil for a city when you gather as one and surrender. This is how He starts a fire. This is how He does it. That's a corporate surrender over and over until the fire increases, until the well increases, and then he sets you on fire. It says when a city says yes to him. So this is what he's saying to every city. This is what he's saying to the city, the Cape Town. He's saying to every city, come together, surrender together. I'll pour out my oil over you, and I will set the entire city on fire. That's what he's going to do. So, you got it? 
So now we're going to surrender. We're going to come into His presence. And we're going to just thank the Lord. And we're going to, first before we thank the Lord, we're just going to ask the Lord to show us what we need to surrender. You got it? We're going to surrender. Right now. So Father, we ask you for grace tonight to surrender. Just ask you for grace, because you cannot do it in your own strength. You cannot do it in your own strength. We're going to surrender to Him. We're going to surrender to His power. We're going to surrender to His wisdom. Thank you, Lord. Just, just ask Him to help you. And I'm going to do this with music. And then at some stage, we're going to, we're going to play for you. But right now, it's for you and I to deal directly with Him. And just say, Lord, I'm serving you. Give up my rights and I give it to you. I'm not going to try and do it by myself anymore. I'm not trying to do anything in my own strength anymore. I'm going to do it by your 